Our first speaker this morning is Dr. Miguel Torres Arquidi. Um, he has a general degree from Nacional Autonomas University of Mexico with a master's degree in biomedical informatics from the School of Medicine at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, he is a senior service fellow with the Division of Health Informatics and Surveillance at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Um, he supports the medical countermeasure tracking system and manages the public uh, web release of information for the National Notifiable Disease Surveillance System. Um, it's really a pleasure to have Dr. Torres Urquidi here today to talk about um, informatics and public health. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, well, first, I, I want to thank the American Institute of Dental Public Health for the invitation. Uh, hopefully, um, uh, you know, through my talk, you, you will identify um, learning examples for dental public health in general, and that will steer our conversation and will allow you to better plan for the future. Uh, public health has made a lot of inroads into what is big data. And hopefully, as uh, Dr. Semino was saying yesterday, you'll do it right from the get-go, and hopefully you will, through my talk, you'll see models that may be of interest to you, whether you want to replicate those models or want to actually the opposite, stay away from them and make sure you do the right thing. Um, so before I start, you know, I work for the government, so I have a couple of disclaimers, you know, the, the views that I'm going to present are mine and not necessarily those of, of um, CEC. Um, another disclaimer, I'm a, a, a co-editor of, uh, now we're working on a second ed edition of a book on uh, medical and dental data integration, so um, you know, uh, we may receive royalties from that, which um, it's, it's, it's just, we do it primarily for love. So, and it, some of my co-editors are here in the audience, uh, Valerie and Tankan, and, and other folks are contributors to the book. So, um, with that, uh, I'm, I want to give you an overview of what the talk is going to be. Um, and there's a lot of material that I want to cover, uh, just to give you uh, some senses. I, I see it primarily two parts. One is the, talking about the NNDSSS, which is the National Notifiable uh, Disease Surveillance System, or diseases are missing an S, and National Syndromic Surveillance Program, which are historically two, what we talked yesterday, ultra large scale, ultra large scale surveillance systems that are now in place, that are supported by the federal government. And, and, and at the end, I want to talk about the challenges of big data that I think you should all be aware uh, that we are already confronting and we are uh, trying to come up with ways to solve. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, so, uh, and, and also give you a little bit of my background. My first um, project in dental informatics was in the year of 1996. And we did something similar to what uh, uh, Dr. Semino, was it Dr. Semino was talking yesterday about cars? Our, my first paper ever was about uh, how dentists will use the internet you know, or were using the internet in their practice. So, um, and I'm, I'm bringing, you, that bringing it to your attention that this dental informatics field actually has been around for a long time. In my case, I've been doing more than 20 years. And, and I, I think. Uh, I bring that, that to your attention because I think it's really important for you to realize that all those things, all those uh, conversations we have had are finally coming to fruition and it's, it's actually very exciting that we have this kind of meeting and now you're starting to, you're going to be, a, people in the room are going to be very important to make that happen. My concern, my worry, what keeps me awake at night sometimes is I want to make sure you get it right because a lot of people in the medical field have struggled and you know because are growing pains yet dentistry have a, has a unique opportunity to make sure you get it right from the get-go and you steer away from from the, many of the challenges and barriers that you know in the medical field has has faced so that's sort of sort of the introduction so first I want to talk about the National Notifiable Diseases Surveillance System um, so, um, and, you know, instead of, you know, usually the government 
talks sometimes are very uh, dry. I'll try to, I, I don't like that. I'll try to make it more interactive. Uh, so I, I want to start, and I want this actually to be more of a conversation. So I want to start with a question. Can someone here tell me what's the difference between a notifiable condition and a reportable condition? What's the difference between a notifiable condition and a reportable condition? Anyone? Who cares? This is probably help, right? No, 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 you don't. No, that's, that's not fair. No, 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 no. Sorry. I have to pull, I have to pull the rank here. Sorry. Uh, yeah? Do you want to say it? Go ahead. There's, there's part, part of it. So, um, Close, close, there. So, okay, so I'm, I'm going to start from there. Um, you know, as you know, there are conditions that are of public health significance. Uh, can anyone name an example? HIV, TB, you know, things that are, you know, that, that you want to make sure you protect. Sorry? Tuberculosis, right? You, they're, they're, they can be contagious and uncontagious that are there are they, they primarily present a danger to the community. You want to make sure that you intervene right away, right? I mean, these are if not right away, you do something about it from the public health perspective. So now, there, as I mentioned, there are two: there are reportable conditions, and there are notifiable conditions. So reportable conditions are those that are mandated or this is required from uh, clinical providers to tell the local health authority that a patient is actually uh, diagnosed with such such condition, that's reportable. And these occur primarily at the state <coughs> level, right? This is this is sort of state or local level. The, every every state has, has a list of what are called reportable conditions. So um, I'm going to talk about notifiable conditions in a minute. So, but I want you to make sure you understand these very well. Um, uh, and the, and the goal of this is dentistry needs to see whether this is the model they want to use. So, so in, in the medical world, you have reportable conditions, and, and these conditions depend on many factors. What makes a condition reportable? Well, we, we already identified one factor, which is, you know, that this is of public health importance, right, that you want to control, you want to make sure you, 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 you do something about it. Uh, however, um, let, me, let me ask you another question. So, uh, do you think malaria is a reportable condition? Yes, no? No, actually, actually the answer is yes. But, yes, but actually, sorry, the answer is it depends. So, um, so um, do you think you get a lot of cases in, oh, I'm gonna use Alaska. Uh, I usually use Montana. Anyone here from Montana? No, that's, that's you know, so, so are the folks in Montana, but you know, um, or, or Alaska. Let's use Alaska. Do you think we get a lot of malaria cases in Alaska? No. Why? Huh? It's cold, right? There, there are no mosquitoes, right? You know, it's uh, there, there is this natural geographic factor that you know, the, because the mosquitoes do not fly up north, there is certain weather-wise, you know, so. It's very unlikely that you'll have malaria cases in Alaska. Now, doesn't mean you don't get malaria cases. People travel that are, that are sick and may actually end up in Alaska being sick with malaria, right? Uh, however, it doesn't make much sense to make a disease reportable in Alaska because you never get cases. And why, why, is, it, why is this a problem? Um, so uh, the way I understand it is usually the chief pathologist at a hospital that ends up doing the paperwork or the clinician, the primary care uh, doctor who has to fill out a form, you know, all the data. I mean, you, you don't understand that the rules change. We have to deal with reportable conditions. You, you, it's okay to send all the information to the public health authority because you want to do something about it. 
and he's and in many cases he's urgent. You have to do it right away. You have to provide as much information as possible. So, uh, you know, in this case, the the burden that you impose, organizationally, administratively speaking, can be high. If, imagine every patient. You're in a hospital. You're in a large hospital. You keep seeing cases and cases and cases. So you got to be very careful of what you make reportable or what you make mandatory to report, right? So, so now we saw that, you know, in Alaska, you're unlikely to get malaria cases. So it doesn't make much sense. It's not really a problem for Alaska to have malaria. However, for Florida, you think malaria occurs in Florida, right? It's more likely to occur in Florida. So now you have two sides, right? You have uh, Montana, I'm more familiar with Montana, so Montana is unlikely to be reportable malaria, but in Florida it is. Now, let's talk about rabies. Do you think you have rabies cases in Montana? More likely, right? You have a lot of wildlife, you have a lot of outdoor activities, you have a, a lot of things that rabies may actually make sense for it to be reportable in, uh, in Montana or, or Alaska and other states. So, you see how Every state can have a different list of what is reportable. Now, many states can have similar reporting, reportable these conditions, right? So, you know, the usual suspects, HIV, tuberculosis, you know, it makes sense that, you know, they have them. Uh, you know, there are, there's a, a very common set of, of diseases. So, now I'm going to move to notifiable conditions. Notifi notifiable conditions are those that the Council of State and Territory Epidemiology is defined to be notifiable. Every year they get together, they, all, all the state epidemiologists, and they look at the diseases that they are prevalent based on their own data, and they agree that nationally, these are the, this is the information that's to be reported to CDC. So, um, now the challenge here is uh, a, a condition can be nationally notifiable and it is submitted to CDC only if that condition is also notifiable at the state, is reportable at the state level. So going back to the reportable conditions of Montana in Florida, if malaria is not reportable in Montana or Alaska, then the state can, does not have information to send up the food chain because by law they are not collecting that information, so they cannot send information they don't have. Uh, on the other hand, Florida, you know, since they have malaria cases, they are sending the information voluntarily to CC, and you know, voluntarily in the sense that we provide grants, and you know, if if, if you get a grant, well, please send us your data. So, so that's that's sort of the distinction. I want to make sure is clear that you know it's it's intricate and and it's a dynamic process where you have reportable conditions at the local state level. You have notifiable conditions at the federal level, and those change can actually change, do change every year. Usually, there's there's a process that is done once per year. Council of State ter the Territorial Epidemiologists get together one once per year, and they publish the list for that year. And diseases get added or taken out depending on how the population trend is changing, or, or the trend in diseases in the population is changing. So, uh, and there are sometimes. Particular situations, for instance, Zika, that uh, things had to be done very rapidly to include them, to include a disease and make it not national notifiable, given the urgency, you know, the urgent need to have. So, um, as you can imagine, um, you know, it's a lot of administrative, technical, and and organizational challenges. So, so we have is, is more than a more than hundred conditions that are. In the national notifiable list, if you multiply that times the number of states, times the number of local uh, uh, health departments, times the number of hospitals and clinical providers in this country, and and you want to do all of it, and it keeps changing, and you want to do the, all of that in an electronic fashion. So, you know, we've been talking about standards, and you know, ideally with the use of computers, you will make this more streamlined. However. It takes a lot of technical expertise to develop systems that work every single time and connect not only between the hospital and the hospital or the you know, 
primary care doctor needs to have an electronic health record that talks to the local health department, then the local health department needs to have another system that talks to the state department, then that state department, that state public health authority needs to connect to CDC, and everything needs to collect, going back to the point of ultra large scale systems. This is sort of what, what my division does, which is, uh, you know, we support all these efforts. We make sure that we provide the tools, we provide the funding, we provide the expertise that is needed so everybody across the board actually is able to send information. And uh, I think one of the challenges for, for, for dental public health is that um, you need to have conversations or, or we need to have conversations of what kind of model you want to use for defining, for instance, these conditions, how, how you want to do your reporting, who's going to be in charge of collecting this data, right? But we've seen so far, for instance, what Mohammed was presenting yesterday, you know, is primarily academic centers who get together and, you know, serve that role or that function of collecting all that information. Now, as we evolve, and we go into a bigger scale, similar to what um, Tankam is doing and what she presented yesterday, where actually primary, uh, uh, you know, general, uh, general practitioners, dental practitioners, uh, or, or specialists start reporting data. You know, you want to do that through an academic model where the academic, you know, whether schools or, or nonprofit organizations, you know, decide to start collecting the data and then aggregate it, or you want to have more of a government model where were local health departments or state health departments start collecting data. The thing is someone needs to be in charge of making sure there's some form of aggregation. Again, these are things that dental public health needs to start thinking about. The NNDSSS model has dealt with all that complexity and, and one of the key elements for us has been that, uh, you know, we have a couple of things or drivers. One is we have the law. You know, we, we, you know it's, it's, it's mandated by law, so data just flows. I mean, it's, by law, you have to report, right? And if you don't, and, and, you know, and, and you have to do it. So that sort of is a driver, which I don't know if in dentistry you want to make that happen. Um, um, there's also the notion of funding, right? You know, you know the CDC provides a lot of funds to jurisdictions to maintain this is, and, 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 you know, and make it sustainable. One of the things, again, Mohammed was talking about yesterday. You want to make sure that these reporting mechanisms become sustainable over time. Um, and, and you need to find out how, you, how you're going to go about it because technology changes, keeps changing all the time, and it's very expensive to maintain. Um, I'm sure I covered all the points. Um, and, you know, it, and in particular, our division, um, you know, we we work very hard in uh, defining, translating what the Council of State and Territorial Epidemiology is defined as, as a notifiable condition into actual standards, into actual electronic messages and what are called implementation guides. So people can take that and retool their systems, whether at the state, local, or the hospital, and actually send the data in a way everybody in the food chain can consume. In the case of the federal level, uh, we, we receive the information, our division receives the information, processes, aggregates it, and then shares that back, whether to the general public through what is called the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report, and, and or we share that with the specific programs or centers within CDC, and each center has their own processes to also make sense of that data and, you know, pu whether publish it or take action as, as it is necessary. Again, think of what should be the model for dental public health, right? Imagine that you all of a sudden have all the dentists in the United States sending data, well, where are they gonna send it? And who's gonna be responsible for that? And you know, if, if there's an, a, a trend, an upward trend on whatever particular condition, who's gonna do something about it? And these are things you need to start considering thinking for the future. So, um, I think I cover it all, so I'm gonna, Transition now to um, CST, to NNDSSS, uh, NSSP uh, model, which is, is more um, recent. Um, and the, 
Sorry, and uh, one, one last thing. These data is publicly available. If you want to take a look, uh, you can access a, a couple of sources. Uh, we publish uh, uh, Wonder, which is you know, a large data set. There's also data.cc.gov, and of course, the, the traditional weekly publication um, where all that, that is available. Um, so, switching gears. Um, so, I have another question. Who is familiar with the term biosurveillance? Biosurveillance. Volunteers, any takers? Okay. So, um, uh, you know, although it started earlier, it really took hold uh, back in the year 2001 with the mailing of the anthrax letters. Um, Public Health started working on figuring out a way to have systems that will provide as close as possible to real-time situational awareness, not a term we saw yesterday, right? Where uh, in case of a bioterrorist attack, you will like to make sure that you're able to detect that something is happening in the community. And I'm gonna make a big introduction to what biosurveillance is, then I'm gonna talk about the systems that we have in place for collecting that data and informing public health and other authorities that something's happening. Um, so, um, so the way it works is uh, electronic health records in hospitals are monitoring patients coming in and we're capturing signs and symptoms of diseases. See, see the difference with notifiable conditions? We capture signs and symptoms that do not necessarily tell us what the patient has but we don't have a diagnosis yet many times. Yet we know some of the things that a patient may lead to. It's like, examples are things like fever, cough, headache, you know, very ge generic, very, a little granular, but, but it's not, not, not very deterministic. Yet you know that, you know, certain conditions, certain signs and symptoms may be tied to certain conditions. And I'll give you a, a, a very good example. Um, uh, enlarged, uh, I think, large mediastinum. There, there's a there's a radiological sign that is rare to see in X-rays. Yet, if a radiologist sees it, is is tied to anthrax. It's one of the uh, um, signs that you can see in the X-ray that is used to determine whether a patient has anthrax. So. Um, if all of the sudden you see a spike of cases all coming from a particular city, then someone needs to go and look at why you have so many of these signs being reported in this particular region in such a short period of time, or in a particular period of time. So, so that's sort of the premise of biosurveillance where you will generate time series of what uh, can be uh, sort of aggregated cases of a set of uh, syndromic definitions, things that may be, you know, anthrax, things that may be, uh, you know, uh, plague, things that may be tularemia. I mean, there, there are several, several diseases that may have particular syndromic representations. So, you build, um, let me see, I think I have a, a picture here. Uh, things that may be actually, uh, maybe a, a condition of concern. So um, you take that and then you take as much hospitals as you can from a particular region and they all start sending data to an aggregating point. In our case, CDC uh, uh, has, paid, has provided funds to actually build the systems and connect all these hospitals. So I think our last analysis, we, we, have, we have about 3,000 hospitals sending data we have millions and millions of records sent all the time, every day. Every time, um, every time someone walks into an emergency department, uh, uh, for instance, um, I don't know the exact, the most recent exact numbers, but something along the lines of every other patient in a metropolitan area in the United States walks into an emergency department, we get certain information about that visit. And the idea is to be able to detect if something's going on with a particular population. So. Uh, Imagine the amounts of data. Imagine, imagine millions and millions and millions of messages coming in with clinical data all the time. 
And then you have to be able to detangle, you know, because if, as you know, healthcare is not necessarily linear. Something is done here, then you send for a lab report, it takes three hours. In the meantime, millions of other messages came in. So you need to be able to backtrack, like needle in the haystack, this message came from this patient. <coughs> Whoa, it's, oh, that patient, that's confirmed. No, it was not confirmed. Oh, okay, then dismiss it. So from the volume perspective, there's a lot of management that needs to occur so you, when you are building your time series. So, um, uh, you know, that's what, that's the model for, for Biosense, which I, I was the acting program manager for a while. Uh, that you know, we send data from the hospital. They hospitals send data to CDC. We provide infrastructure, the software, uh, funds for states to actually access their own data. Only them, only the states and jurisdictions have access to their own data. If they want to share that data with other jurisdictions, for instance, you have two jurisdictions that share a border. They may it may be a good idea for them to actually share information, right? Because disease does not necessarily respect. Uh, geopolitical boundaries. So, so agreements needs to occur within the jurisdictions to share data and let, let each other see what's happening on the other side of the world. So, um, and, you know, and we, we have other, yeah, I'm not getting get into that, also gets combined to actually provide a better clarity in terms of situational work. So, um, and that's sort of the bias and small where someone, you know, it, uh, is it ne it's near real time, you know, uh, they, you know, all the time we're, we're receiving data, and then you need to build the algorithms. This is really key and really important. Build the algorithms that are able to handle this amount of information. So imagine you go back to your, um, uh, you know, to your jurisdiction, in, and all the dentists start sending you data that work with you, of all the patients that all of a sudden you're, they are seeing that day. And, and, and it can become overwhelming, and you need to figure out a way how you're going to manage, how you're going to store, how you're going to back up, how you're going to you know, do all these things that need to be put in place so the, the system becomes useful. And, and not, only, not only the snapshot of right now, but you also have a way to keep historical trends, which is another factor which I have mentioned. You know, you want to compare, for instance, whether the number of cases we have now is normal. For instance, in the summer, you're more likely to have things whether it's to you know gastrointestinal diseases, right? Summer, right? And 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 all of a sudden you see a spike of cases. Oh wait, everything's okay. We happen to be in summer, but you only know that if you have several years of data, so you can compare and detect that trend. And those are things that, I mean, it's important for dental public health to start considering. So that's sort of a big picture idea from the NSSP. And the other thing I wanted to how many doing the time. But ten minutes. Ten minutes. So, um, so, so I wanted to switch gears and, and now talk a little bit about big data and I think things that are, should be important as we move forward in, in the dental public health realm. Um, actually, we had we had very interesting dinner last night and, and uh, I think one of the challenges that we'll see coming forward as more data start flowing in is you need to. Um, you know, epidemiologists, statisticians, researchers, um, and, and dental public health experts need to start coming to terms with that this notion of big data means. Um, uh, uh, and, and here, you know, I, I, I want you to think about, you know, the, the way we have done research for the most part in the 20th century. Uh, and, and this ties to what Doug Friesman was presenting yesterday of the little circles and then the big circles and the population circle. Um, big, big. Um, so far, what we have done or the methods that we have are based on samples, right? Think of it. We always try, the studies are, we have this sample that hopefully will be representing this particular population. And, and usually that gets reflected with uh, in the statistical world is called p-values, right? If you have a strong p-value, that means you, you're really finding an effect or really proving what you're thinking, right? It, it's good. A good p-value means you're good. You're, you're, it's foundation. It, it really represents what you want to do. And the bad thing is when you have error, you know, and you want to control for error. So um, in the big data world, some of these things are not as important. In what do I mean with that? Since you no longer have a sample, uh, as 
now you have an entire population. I mean, I, I'll, give, I'll, I'll give the example with uh, uh, Biosense. Uh, if we have an agreement with the VA. So uh, we get, I think, all the emergency department, but a lot of, um, and maybe, maybe all of the VA data from the emergency department. So if your population, population of study that you're defining is VA patients going to the ER, in our case, we have all the data. We have all the, all, I mean, we have the entire population. For that particular study or question, we have all of it. So all of a sudden, these um, sample-based methods, that is p-value, you don't need it. What you see is it. You have the entire population. You, that's it. You don't. You don't need to do this inf, in, inference. You don't have to do because because you have all. You have the entire population, right? So, so it, it's descriptive, but you, it don't, doesn't necessarily mean causation. Yet you have the entire population. So all these statistical methods that you had no longer are not strong. And actually, what you need to do there's a risk. And I like uh, Valerie, uh, Valerie's term yesterday. You, you have artificial intelligence, but you also have artificial stupidity. So you have to be careful because since you have all the data, you can actually, you can actually prove a lot of things, right? You can have a lot of, you know, you, it's like looking at noise, right? Uh, when you have a noisy data, you can, have, you can find conclusions that are not necessarily true. So that means also, you know, you need to think hard of what are the methods that are effective, not that you are in a different type of area where you have more of a, you know, more of a whole population type of studies. And, and as we move forward, this is going to happen more and more and more. And not only that, you're going to have, in the case of, of Biosense, we have, you know, we, we have data from other sources. We have laboratory data. We have other sources that also come in and actually makes your analysis is much, much different than what we were used to sort of in the 20th century way. In the 21st century, we have to really shift gears and start finding methods that are applicable in, in this uh, new scenario. So um, I think that's all I have. Uh, and uh, you know, I, I like the, the three, the four Bs that uh, Bruce uh, mentioned yesterday. You know, um, you know, I think what is important, it was veracity, variety, um, uh, uh, velocity, and, and volume. So, so uh, my, my warning here is has to do with volume, right? It has to do with, with, you know, what you do when you have a lot of it. And you have to be very careful as, you know, these, these new, uh, like what Mohammed presented yesterday, all of the sudden you'll have a lot of cases and you have to be very careful what you're going to do when you have all the information. You have to really be uh, thoughtful that, and, and think, take a step back and see that the methods that you've been using may not necessarily apply. And there may be other things like probabilistic approaches that seems present a better way on how to, uh, how to deal with if you want to prove something from, from the statistical uh, perspective. So I think, I think we're good. And, uh, let me finish early, but I want to make sure I leave time for, for questions. And no, no, but um, the answer is no. But but I talked to those folks, uh, being a dentist myself. So um, uh, however, it, actually, it's good that you brought that up because um, you know the. Uh, there are, in Biosense, we have used some of the data. So, so sorry, the, the question was, do, um, do we process data related to uh, oral surveillance? And um, the, the answer is no, our division is not charging that. You know, as you know, CC is very large, and there, there are different, every center, every program, every division, they may work in a different way. We get a lot of data, but not necessarily theirs. Uh, on the other hand, through, I mean, this reference, the, the first reference, I, I like it because they use Biosense data to do things related to oral, oral conditions. In this particular study, what my colleagues did was uh, they look at the use of emergency departments for uh, dealing with dental emergencies, right? So, and, you know, it has to do with Medicaid and, you know, the impact you have in the population and the cost, right? 
So it's an alternative source that usually you wouldn't, you wouldn't think of, right? But there's big segment of the population that that's what they do, right? As you as you all know that you know I, I have no access to dental care, so I end up in the emergency department because that's that's our source. So all of a sudden, the biosense data actually became very useful to look at that particular segment because that's where the data actually sits and not in the traditional dental repository. So um, I don't, going back to your question, I don't, uh, we don't necessarily do, but I'm in touch. I mean, I, I know I know the folks, if, if you want me to put them, put you in touch. Oh, oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm, yeah. Right. getting from all over all the over place, place yeah. then how long is it, are the data that are based on the basic screening survey going to be useful to uh -huh. people because it's very labor intensive to collect the data. Right. So, yeah, so um, um, one of, um, I can't remember who was telling me, uh, there are two things. There are two things with surveillance. Uh, and again, the, the views are mine, not necessarily those of my employer. Uh, you want to get it fast or you want to get it right. And so, so, and that's a challenge, right? Um, and, and in case of, I mean, I, I can only speak to what we do in our division, more familiar with, um, you know, in the case of uh, MMWR, uh, what happens is you get a lot of aggregation, a lot of work that has to happen and usually once per year, there's sort of like a final count on where the, the states, they all check and make sure that the numbers they have actually are the ones numbers. And think of it, uh, you know, sometimes a patient comes in, the diagnosis is made through the lab, the patient goes away, the patient comes back, they think about it, yeah, actually this is what you have X. But that took a month and and the form wasn't really sent, and then that, that paper gets handed to someone else and gets reported. So there's naturally a delay because of the nature of our systems, meaning not electronic systems, but the overall health system, that, that data doesn't flow right away. So there needs to be also a process of consolidation and aggregation and checking and validation, right? So. And even if it is electronic, they want to make sure that all the data gets the same is correct. And you know, sometimes errors are made and corrections have to be done. No, the patient did not end up having X. Further testing demonstrated that it wasn't what we thought it was. And then you have to roll back. So I, I think that's a big good point that you, know, uh, you also need to build that in in your reporting processes to make sure that you know, the data you're getting accurate is accurate. Uh, but that takes time. So. Um, you know, uh, at least I, I can speak from going back again, going back to your question, I can speak from, from our system. There's a consolidation process in the case of NNDSSS that um, happens once per year, and then you close the year, and then you go on to next year. Um, I'm not familiar with how it's done from the oral perspective. I'll be more than happy to follow up with you and get you an answer how, how they manage. And I'm, I'm sure they have a similar process to make sure that. Sure, it. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I think we have time for one more quick question. Anybody else has a follow-up question? Thank you. Thank you so Thank much, you. Dr. Torres.